Right. Good morning. Good morning. Are you all feeling good? Yes. I'm feeling slightly Sunday morning-ish. This is my first time in Japan. I was taken to a karaoke bar last night. <laughs> and I attempted Goldfinger like Shirley Bassey at the end of the night. And if my voice goes at some point, that's, that's why. Um, if you could call it the critical thinking, anyway. Um, so my name is John Hughes. If you want copies of the slides that I use today, you can email me. The email is up on the first slide. It's also being recorded and streamed, apparently, so there's multiple ways you can get the information from this presentation. I also have a blog called elteachertrainer.com and there is a section on critical thinking with links to lots of different things related to critical thinking in ELT. And next year I have a methodology book coming out with National Geographic Learning on this topic where I attempt to demystify critical thinking and make it relevant to the English language classroom. And some of what's in that I'm going to share with you today. Critical thinking, it's a real buzzword in the 21st century, and we often think that it's only started in the 21st century. But the first use of the term is at the beginning of the 20th century, and if you come from a university background, a sort of English for academic purposes background, you'll have been using the term for some years. We start to see it in common use in the 1940s. Writers like Glazer uses it, and they refer to the idea of students reading texts, identifying the arguments, looking for the evidence. And that kind of definition of critical thinking continues through the 20th century. Except I was in Brazil recently and started reading the work of Paulo Freire who contrasts critical thinking in the sort of 1970s with naive thinking and he talks about naive thinking in terms of the teacher passing on information the students receiving the information that is teaching versus critical thinking transfer of information and the students start to discuss and question it. So you start to see the slight change in a broadening of the definition of critical thinking later on in the 20th century. Then we get to the 21st century and everybody's talking about 21st century skills and it's one of the four C's and critical thinking kind of goes mainstream. Suddenly the media uses the term critical thinking. I, just a few weeks ago I read a uh, a newspaper report on Google, and Google had done a survey of the top characteristics it looked for when employing graduates or new recruits. In 1998, when Google began, 20 years ago, the main recruitment criteria was somebody with software, programming skills, technical skills. 20 years later, their seven top skills include things like leadership, problem solving, and critical thinking is way up there, and technical skills are down at number seven. So suddenly those kinds of skills have, have changed and critical thinking is being prioritized in the 21st century. Why are educators concerned about it? Uh, well, let me give you a personal anecdote. I'd like to show you a picture of a couple of my students from Oxford. I teach both academic English at the university sometimes, but I also teach quite low-level English to refugees. So here's a picture of my students. I suspect they look a bit similar to yours, similar-ish. I've noticed that Japanese students are probably dressed slightly better than my students, but but basically, there's something universal about the position of these two students. They are hunched over their mobile devices. And I think this is part of the reason why educators are concerned about and, and suddenly emphasising critical thinking. Because our students are pulling their information from their mobile devices and they're getting all of this information but educators are concerned they're not questioning the information, they're not using it, they're uh, not really thinking about it. 
Let me give you a, a real life example from the classroom. This is possibly similar to situations you've had. I have a group of elementary level students and I have them, 15 of them, and they sit in a semicircle in my class, and that's how we do the lessons. And for one lesson, I wanted to help them buy second-hand objects, because a lot of them are refugees and low-paid workers living in Oxford. So I made posters, for sale posters, and I put nice big photographs of the objects on the posters, and things I had for sale, bicycle, for sale, uh, old TV, for example, and they with little descriptions so the students could look at the vocabulary for buying second hand objects because they don't have much money. And with one student over here, he was from a particular country, he was very excited that lesson because he just bought his first mobile phone since arriving in the UK. He hadn't been able to get one until this point, but brought it to class, showed it to me, and I went, Oh, very nice, yeah, good, good. And I handed out the posters, and his poster said, for sale, table and chair. And then it had a photograph of a table and chair. So real elementary level material, description of how to buy it, where to get it. So I set my students off with a reading task, and I look across, and there's my student, and he's typing into his phone during the lesson. Okay, so I go over to see what he's doing. And he's got Google Translate open, and he's typing in T-A-E-L-E. -E. And with my patient teacher face on, I pointed at the word table, pointed at the picture of the table. Look, it's table. And inside the human is going, it's table, isn't it? Obvious. You don't need to translate it. But you don't. Anyway, he puts the phone down, continues reading. I walk away and then I look back and he's typing again and I go over and it's C-H-A-I-R and he's typing in chair for the translator. So I just leave it, leave it to Until finally he holds his phone up to me in, with sheer pleasure that Google Translate has confirmed that I am the teacher and it is correct and that is a table and that is a chair. And that incident makes me think there's a very good book called Why Do I Need a Teacher When I've Got Google? It's an excellent read, I really recommend it, because it addresses this issue. If students can translate English words, get their information, then what is our job? Somehow I think it's part of the increasingly the role of the teacher is to develop this critical thinking machine and get students to just go beyond that level. Yes, they can translate the words, they can check things online, so our role as a teacher has to be something slightly more than that. And critical thinking is one of those terms with many definitions, it comes with kind of mysterious connotations, and if you read the literature, there are so many definitions out there. And I started to think, well, so how does it really relate to everyday English language teaching? So I went off and started to look into the topic. One of the things I did was do an online survey with teachers where I asked them various questions. And teachers from around the world took part in this survey. I did. We had some people from Japan answer it. One of the questions I gave participants was, I said, can you define critical thinking in relationship to ELT teaching in your context? Can you define it in about one sentence using six or seven words? What was, what's your perception of what critical thinking is? So they had critical thinking is, and they've had to fill in a box with their definition. In a minute I'm going to show you a selection of what I got back from the teachers. Before I do, can you turn to a person next to you or near to you and just define, give them your definition of what you think critical thinking is. In about six or seven words, just try it.
Yes. 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 Okay. So let me show you some other teachers' responses. Just have a quick read and see if your suggestion is up here or <coughs> similar. These are from a selection of teachers. Responses, and I had about a hundred teachers share their ideas, and I got some very different ideas on what critical thinking is. With these, um, some phrases and words that popped out at me in red, the top one says it's a useful tool. I do think for a language teacher using critical thinking in the classroom, you can regard it almost like a tool, a kind of mindset to apply to language teaching, and it can be helpful in that sense. I like the idea of the second one of connecting ideas, students making links in their language learning. They've learned something and then they see it in the context of something else and they make connections. Uh, improving study skills, certainly if you teach English for academic purposes at university level, we do a lot of work in terms of study skills developing critical thinking, but I don't see any reason why the same can't be true uh, in your general English classes as well. Ability to think, reflect, analyse an argument, that's a very EAP type definition of critical thinking. The fifth one, seeing things from a different perspective. If you teach teenagers, teenagers find it tricky to see things from different perspectives. They have a perspective and their brains are still developing at the front. So sometimes their perspective is sort of limited and part of our role is to sort of develop those abilities to see things from other points of view and that they can develop and widen their language used by developing perspective. Uh, I heard one or two people here use the word, it's questioning, it's asking questions. And it's certainly, I like the idea that as teachers, we spend ridiculous amounts of time asking our students questions, and course books do it even more. I mean, I write them and we write loads of comprehension questions. I want students to come to class and develop a classroom environment where students ask the questions. Not, it's not always the teacher asking the questions, so questioning everything. And common definition using higher level thinking. Um, in contrast to lower order thinking and higher order thinking. And I think if you're a language teacher, it's really helpful to place critical thinking in the context of lower order and higher order thinking. Now normally when we talk about lower and higher order thinking at this point, the presenter presents you a colourful triangle and starts talking about Bloom's taxonomy and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I have an issue only with that, and part of it is misinterpretation of what Bloom was trying to say, but it presents thinking as separate steps almost, and you try to get to the top. The other thing is it's often presented vertically and I prefer horizontally because I think we have to remember that lower order is just as important as higher order. And sometimes this implication is that somehow higher order is something better to try and achieve. The two things for me have to work in balance, particularly in the language classroom. Um, so let's just break this down a little bit. And I've kind of made it what I think is more user friendly for language teachers. So with, um, with sort of typical definitions of lower order thinking, we get remembering, understanding, and applying. So basically, in terms of the language classroom, you present a word, the students have to remember it, understand what it means, and then use it. So you might present a word, match it to a picture, practice it in a gap for exercise. You're checking students have re remembered the word and can understand it. In, 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 Classroom terms, it's about basic comprehension and use. And it's what teachers do every day of their lives. Well, if they don't, they probably should go and get a different career because it's what we do. This kind of lower order thinking work. And lots of course books work on this. We present, we practice, we, we use the language. 
At the other end, a higher order thinking, we often talk about to create or creative thinking. And in English language teaching, creativity seems to be rewarded a lot these days. If we're a creative teacher, oh, we must be good. Or if we go into a classroom and students are doing lots of creative things, that's great. It seems to be a kind of a, a thing to aspire to. But when I work with teachers, I do a lot of teacher training, when I observe lessons, I see lots of this going on, lots of this going on, but not so much of this going on. And this is a slight simplification of where critical thinking sits, it stretches, and you'll notice the overlaps which are important. But we have to treat lower and higher order thinking as a moving kind of scale within a language classroom which affects our lesson planning. And I'm interested in how we can get more of that in the classroom because I think it improves basic comprehension, it improves creative thinking. To recognise when these things are happening in the classroom, it's a generalisation, but there are certain exercise types going on. In a basic comprehension type thing, students are doing fill-the-blank exercises. They're doing true-false. Maybe they're matching words. They're finding an answer in a text, doing very basic comprehension work. They're gathering information at the back of their brain, basically, and they're checking that they understand language. If you were looking at a classroom where there was a bit more critical thinking going on, you might see exercises where students have to analyse a text or analyse a sentence. They have to infer meaning. Maybe there isn't literal meaning in a the text. They have to infer or work out what the author is saying or what the author is writing in a the text. They have to discover the meaning much more, which affects our approach to language teaching. It's not just us telling the students, it's the students discovering meaning. And as we all know, that can be sometimes more difficult to convince students to do in the classroom. Or they're evaluating opinions and they're comparing it with their own opinions. But you'd expect to see that kind of work going on in that classroom where there was some critical thinking happening. In terms of creativity, you'd expect students to see students maybe giving presentations, writing essays, writing stories, maybe making a video, but creating a new and original text with the language they've got and the rest of their knowledge. Typically, it's a much sort of freer practice stage of the lesson. But, if, but don't confuse creative thinking with just applying the language in a controlled way. Creative thinking is about letting the students loose. They're going to make mistakes. It's about embracing mistakes and trying things out. So for me in the language classroom, this is quite a, a useful thing to have in my head, and it's certainly it's something I have in my head when I'm writing materials, so I get a good balance of activity types across a lesson. And I think if, you, if you're involved in teacher training, it's a useful thing to, to offer teachers because it improves the quality of their lesson planning. Let's see this in a very practical way, okay? Let's apply it to a real classroom situation. Imagine I'm starting a lesson off with a group of pre-intermediate students, and I'm going to start the lesson by showing them a photograph. Here's our photograph. What do you think is the topic of my lesson today? Communication. Could be communication. Could be the age of people, generations, yeah? Anything else possible? Small chat. Small talk, small chat, yeah. Gender. Huh? Gender. Could be gender, yeah. Could be gender. Uh, somebody else suggested it could be fashion, clothing, appearance. Could be communication, could be technology. Generation gap. Yeah, the gap between people, the relationship between people. Spatial awareness. Spatial awareness, yeah. There's just enough space between them that another person puts it down. Wow. <laughs> I haven't thought of that one. That's a real critical thinker in the audience at the moment. Okay. The point is, with this kind of image, the test of a really good image to use with students is one that can be used in lots of different ways. 
And it's also an image that demands questions. It's not the teacher asking the questions. Students can look at this and it, it asks you questions. Let's um, do a little exercise then. If we were going to use this photograph to start off the lesson, I could do a variety of things. Now I've got here 10 questions or tasks that I could set the student. Obviously I wouldn't set the student all of these in one lesson, but I could use a variety of them. With the person next to you, they are mixed up, but can you reorder them from lower order thinking to higher order thinking? So imagine you have a scale, lower up to higher. Just discuss where you think they would come on that lower, higher order thinking scale. A couple of minutes, discuss where you place them. connecting what they see in the picture with their own experience. So we're starting to, that idea of connecting ideas. And then at the top we get more of the creative thinking, you give the photo a title, imagine you're in the picture, and we start to develop the student's creative thinking. Probably the one that you might put in a different position is compare the three women. You might get a student who just says, she's older than the other woman, and that just checks their understanding and use of comparative adjectives. And you will get some students who give you much more creative, higher order answers. So of course these tasks are not, you know, they don't guarantee a certain response and you may place them in, in different parts. What's helpful for, if we think about the use of images like this, is that we go beyond that, just that basic comprehension work, and we use images in a much more interesting way. And as a teacher, it saves you time, because you can bring in a picture one day, and then bring it in for the next lesson, and do something completely different with it, because you're applying that 
thinking, how can I get them in thinking at different levels? And you design your activities with that, with that in mind. So I think it's a really helpful mindset for teachers. Let's dig a little deeper now. Let's go right into the classroom and think about, first of all, uh, critical thinking in terms of grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation teaching. Typically, critical thinking is often linked with the skills, reading, that kind of thing. But actually, it affects the way we approach language teaching. Let's start with some grammar. Here's a grammar lesson you've all taught. ED, past simple, regular verbs. Everybody recognise this one? Yep. Unit 6 elementary, probably, something like that. We've got two choices as a teacher. We can either do this approach, present the timeline, the sentences, focus on ED endings, give them the rule. Tell students how you use the past simple. You tell them, put ED on every verb, the students are really happy until they come across the verb go, and then they think, what? That doesn't work, that's not a rule, that's not true. Um, or, we can take the approach at the top, we give them sentences, and we ask students questions, and they have to discover the meaning. Which approach do your students prefer, top or bottom? My students often prefer the bottom. I often start with the top, I ask them the questions, and then if they're looking a bit tired, they say, oh, teacher, just tell us the rule. We just want to know the rule. I don't want to discover it. So it's a hard sell. It's not easy to do sometimes. And it's part of learner training. And I think in, in the methodology books, they would call it the difference between a deductive and inductive approach. What we're actually talking about is the difference between lower and higher order thinking in terms of how we approach grammar. And I would say you present the grammar using both approaches. I might introduce it with the tell them approach and then I might review it the next day with the discover the meaning, let's see if you can remember the rule approach. Or I give them the higher order discover the meaning approach and then I'll say check it in the back of the language reference book or whatever it is and see if you're correct. But it's all about balance. And by, by introducing that top approach, you're developing those higher order critical thinking skills which will equip them later on for becoming autonomous learners. And a lot of that critical thinking is about learner autonomy. Let's uh, apply the same thing with vocabulary teaching. Everybody in the world uses fill the blank or gap fill exercises. So imagine I've been by the way, if you didn't come at the beginning, I'll give you my email at the end, you can get the slides, okay? At the top, if I'd been teaching this vocabulary for describing things in the house, I could have them fill the gaps, yeah? But if I wanted to bring a bit of higher order thinking to the class, I could say to my students, look, you've seen lots of fill the gap exercises in the course book, why don't you write your own? So I put the students in pairs, I give them five new words, I tell them, create your own gap fill exercise. Imagine you're the materials writer, design a gap fill exercise for those five words with your partner. Then swap over and see if the other pair can fill the gaps. At which point the students start arguing because they'll say, but that question isn't fair, the one you wrote there, it doesn't work. But that's good because they're suddenly having to discuss the vocabulary and the real meaning behind it. I suspect that when my students leave the class, they are more likely to remember those five words than those five words because they've had to do so much more with them. The challenge for the teacher, the criticism, not criticism, the things that teachers will say to me is, that's great, but I don't have time to do all of that in my lesson. I have time to do that, but I can't have time to fit that in. I think you have to find time to fit that in because that's why people come to class. I can set that for homework, but I can't do this for homework. And it's just refocusing what's going on in the class. Uh, works for pronunciation too. Here's pronunciation exercise. 
Now this is a pronunciation test for people speaking British English, so to all my US American speaker friends, you might find this one a bit challenging, but let's see how we go. <laughs> Short and long vowels, okay? I've got two ways of approaching it. I can do lower order, listen and repeat. Let's try it. Chip, cheap. Chip, cheap. Very good class. Cat, cart. Cat, cart. Cord, cord. Cord, You see, drilling is so satisfying. You get scared of drilling, listen and repeat. I love it, it's great. It's satisfying. We can, it's all lower order thinking. Now, check that I've got it. Here's a bit of higher order thinking, long and short vowels. There's three sentences. The underlying word has a short vowel. Talk to the person next to you. If you turn it into a long vowel, how does the meaning of the sentence change? Just try it. It gets students to discover things about language. They start noticing the way we really use language in authentic texts. 
Another example, it, it's true also with listening. If I was using a listening where somebody's talking about places to go on holiday or travel, typical kind of listening from the course book, you might ask, listen to the talk about foreign travel, where does the speaker suggest you travel this summer? You're just listening for the names of places, basically. So basic checking. If you want to understand the speaker's opinion, you might say, focus on the adjectives, because speakers don't say, in my opinion, I think. I know we teach students to say this, in my opinion, I think, and I would say go on teaching it, because it's useful for students learning how to express opinion. But actually, in real English, we use opinion adjectives much more to express opinions and we express our opinions indirectly. So we might be listening to the speakers and listen to the talk, get the students to listen to the adjectives to describe the places, and then decide, are the adjectives positive, negative, or neutral? Because then you can really understand, is the speaker recommending something or not? This requires deeper listening. So I do this one first, and this would be my second listening. But sometimes second listenings in course books they're just comprehension checks again. It's just testing. It's not teaching anything. It's just checking. Oh, you didn't understand it the first time? I know. Here's a harder exercise. Let's do it again. Well, hey, you know, how am I supposed to deal with that? Whereas this is sort of developing and you're, you're focusing students on things, but they're just thinking a bit more deeply about what happens with real English. Into the issue of uh, reading and listening, of course, comes a hot topic of information literacy, digital literacy, because we can give students texts and ask questions about texts, but nowadays we also need to get students to think about where is the information coming from. Here's a quick, quick task. This is off the internet. Photograph. With the person next to you, which do you think is fake, top or bottom, and tell them why. Use a bit of visual literacy. It was by a person who claimed to be a National Geographic photographer, and they had won a National Geographic Photograph of the Year competition, apparently, they said, and everybody retweeted this. Oh, isn't this a fantastic picture of a shark? Until somebody at National Geographic realized, well, who is that person? And we don't have a National Geographic Photograph competition of the year, so what's that? And suddenly it was sort of unraveled. Um, this is actually a photograph by a proper National Geographic photographer, but it's has more authenticity. It just highlights the issue that when the students are reading things in their own language, but particularly in English or a foreign language, how much harder it is to assess where information is coming from. If you teach English for academic purposes, I use this with my students because my students have to go do research projects and so on. So at the beginning of the term I give them this exercise because it staggers me where students think it's okay to quote from. They will quote things in their research papers from all sorts of different sources. So I give them this exercise, I give them a list of different sources they score each one between one, two and three. If they don't think it's reliable, if it might be reliable, they need to check, or three if they think it's a reliable source. 
So A, they might put, well, one, I wouldn't use that and quote it in my thesis or my dissertation, for example, because it's just a shared post. Though I might follow the link to its original source and see if it's okay. An article in a newspaper, that generates discussion about, well, what kind of newspaper is it? Well, what do we know about the newspaper and the associations of that? But again, students in studying English might not be able to make that distinction or know the background to different newspapers. This is an interesting one. An entry on Wikipedia, that used to be a big no-no in academic writing. I started to read articles by academics saying, well, actually, Wikipedia's reaching the point where sometimes it's quite reliable. As long as you check the sources, they don't actually stop their students using it certainly as a starting point. The exercise is really just getting, it's a good dis way to start discussion in the classroom on where we can trust information coming from. And that is a significant change to the way we approach um, teaching in terms of information literacy nowadays. Which brings me to the last part, critical thinking in terms of speaking and writing. Let's start with speaking. When we do lessons with critical thinking, quite often it involves discussion. We want students having read something or listened to something to maybe react, discuss it, have a debate, for and against. That type of activity comes up. And obviously we need to teach students language. Sometimes teachers say to me, but I can't do discussions in class. My students don't have an opinion. And I say, well, actually, have you taught them the language in order to express opinions in different ways as a starting point? So, with pre-intermediate students, we might teach this kind of language to start them off. And I might give them a discussion task, and each student has a copy of this in their hand, and as they use each of the phrases, they tick the phrase, and the winner is the person who uses all the phrases first. It's just a control practice way of getting them using that language, and then they use it more freely in proper discussions. With that bad students, I have had bad students who are often, as soon as we have a class discussion, they go back to using that type of language. I think, in my opinion, it's very, because there's no nuance. So with the advanced students, I spend time looking at ways of presenting an argument, but, you know, hedging, tentative language, that kind of work. You get more subtlety in their responses. But teaching them language isn't enough. For good critical thinking, you need to teach strategies. And I think it's particularly at high levels, it's worth spending time helping students to plan the discussion. So I use this kind of planning grid. So if we're having a class debate on, for example, uh, I think people spend too much time on looking at screens, for example, if that was the debate, I'd have the students in charge of the argument for, students in argument against, and the students would have to brainstorm their three main arguments that they would use either for or against in that column. And they'd just do notes, they'd write notes, or they'd work on it in groups or pairs. Having got their three main arguments, rather than start the discussion, I say, how do you think the other side is going to counter that argument? What are they going to say as a reply? And then, if they counter with that, how are you going to counter their argument again? This takes time. You might need, you know, 15, 20 minutes of group discussion to prepare the discussion. But if they've done this kind of critical thinking about it, and this kind of preparation, the quality of the discussion is just so much better. And quite often students might have to go off and research their arguments. You might set it as a homework task. You could apply the same principle to planning an essay, an argumentative essay, for example, but without that critical thinking time, you just don't get good quality discussion in the classroom quite often. And that's why discussions die, because a teacher hasn't devoted the time to thinking critically about what you're going to say. My final point relates really to the relationship between critical thinking and creative thinking. There is a term, critico-creative thinking, which refers specifically to that relationship between critical thinking and creative thinking. 
And its argument would be that you cannot have good creativity in the classroom without critical thinking. If you think of famous artists, creative people, they're actually real critical thinkers. That's why they're so good at what they do to some extent. Um, and quite often, I said at the beginning, we, we're good as teachers at basic comprehension work. We like creativity in the classroom, but if we miss out the critical thinking, sometimes the creative thinking is quite weak. And not all of your students are natural creative thinkers. So let's, let's learn a lesson from a very creative company. Who is this? This is Nemo. Nemo is universally recognised. Pixar, Pixar's part of Disney, that created Nemo, one of the most successful film companies in recent years. They are very famous for their wonderful animation. But Pixar had a secret. And if, like me, you have kids, and you often have to go to the cinema and take the kids to see this kind of film, or you're watching it on you know, the video for the tenth time, if you want to give yourself a little exercise, think critically about Pixar films and think about how the film is structured, because the real strength of Pixar films is the storytelling, and Pixar has a secret. They get all their people in one room, and those people have a secret code, and it's a six-sentence structure. And if you think critically about any Pixar film and many other films, you will discover the sixth sentence structure. So you can analyze it and discover it, but I'm going to tell you. It's this. Once upon a time, every day, one day, because of that, because of that, until finally. If you know that structure, you can create a Pixar film plot within minutes. And you also suddenly the students know if you're if you're teaching, for example, storytelling, if you ask students to do storytelling, then end up with something fairly unstructured. Give them this, and even the students you, who you think isn't creative will come up with a story. So, once upon a time there was a fish called Nemo. Every day Nemo went to school. One day Nemo got lost. Because of that, his father went to look for Nemo. Because of that, his father pulled, brought him back from Australia until finally he came home. That's basically the plot of Finding Nemo and many other Pixar films. Once you've analysed it in that way, it becomes dead easy. Let me unleash your creative thinking. With the person next to you, I'm going to give you one minute, you are going to create a Pixar film using six-sentence structure. It's a creative thinking task. Here we go. You ready? I'll give you the first sentence. Once upon a time, there was an English teacher in Japan. Go. structure of different models of text and giving students that framework 
they thought critically about it first, their creativity, their ability to produce it becomes so much better, so much more effective. This exercise, yes, you could do it with teenagers, young learners and so on. I learned this from a business book by a guy called Daniel Pink called To Sell Is Human. Fantastic book if you're a business English teacher, Daniel Pink, To Sell Is Human. But companies now teach this as a strategy to summarize the story behind your company. So if you're defining your language school, the story behind it, what is its ethos, try this out, actually. And you'll, if somebody says, tell me about your company, using this kind of structure, I mean, don't start once upon a time. <laughs> but using this kind of structure gives you the framework to say very quickly, it's almost like the elevator pitch. In one minute you can define who you are, what your history is, and how you arrived to where you are now. Really useful exercise to do with staff if you want to really define what, what your school is about. So that kind of work in terms of writing, I think, is that it shows that relationship between critical and creative thinking and just how important it is. Final thing in the lesson that you teach, critical reflection. You can give students this sort of exercise. If they've done a piece of writing, they could then swap their writing with a partner and they could use this sort of can-do type checklist to check their partner's written the work. I mean, we're all familiar with that kind of peer feedback type task. It's good for getting students thinking and reflecting on their own work quite critically, rather than the teacher always telling the student, oh, you did this well, but you need to do more of this. And quite often we're getting the students to reflect on their own work. But take it a step further than this. Once you've been teaching essay writing or presentation skills, it's also true for this. Take it a step further, bring in a blank form to class and spend 15 minutes in the class with the students Say, okay class, for the next essay, you're gonna define what you think makes a good essay. Let's discuss in groups and build it up. And the class define how the essay is going to be assessed, in their own words. You need to manage it, but that process of thinking through, actually, what is it that makes a good essay, or what is it that makes a good presentation, it will improve the quality of what they then do themselves even before the assessment is taking place. And again, teachers say to me, yeah, but this takes a lot more time than just giving it to them. Yeah, it does, but the quality of what you get is so much better. And it's that critical reflection time in the classroom. Great in speaking and writing lessons. How do we bring it all together? Well, I'm going to give you a piece of homework. Don't worry, I'm not going to mark it. <laughs> You're just going to do it on your own, okay? One task I do, I use this in teacher training, but I also use it to reflect on my own materials writing. I have this kind of graph pro forma. This represents the length of my lesson. So my lesson might be 60 minutes long, 45 minutes, whatever. Okay, so this is zero minutes, this is the end of the lesson. And then I can observe the lesson, or I can self-observe the lesson, and I draw a little trend line that rises and falls according to the moments in the class when I think the students are engaged in lower order thinking tasks and when I think they're involved in higher order thinking tasks. And it gives me a snapshot of what really happens in my class. Or it, when I'm writing course materials in a course book, I can look at the, the page and say, actually, have I got the flow of exercises right there? Or have I completely forgotten to include any higher order thinking? It's a really good self-reflection task for teachers. It's very revealing. I get teachers to do it. I tell them to think of your last lesson and just draw the line that you think and then present it to your partner and see what... And suddenly teachers notice things about their lesson. So you might get this kind of trend happening. A teacher might draw the one on the right or on the left. And there isn't a wrong right answer except it's kind of interesting. What I notice about lower levels, elementary, pre-intermediate, you often get this kind of pattern. Because typically, we introduce language points, we tell the students, we do the gap fill, we get them to do it in a controlled way, and then we give them a freer practice bit in this bit of the lesson. And then we monitor, we give them feedback, and we tell them 
what was good or bad. So you get that typical pattern often happens. In higher level classes, upper intermediate, advanced, you often see this kind of pattern. Maybe the teacher started with some brainstorming and then students had to reflect on the best ideas from the brainstorming. Then the teacher brought in a reading or a listening text and then gave them another creative thinking task. But instead of the teacher telling them what they did, the students are reflecting on their own work afterwards and so you get that different sort of pattern. There are different approaches. You also notice from this that lower level classes have a higher proportion of lower order thinking going on, which you would expect. That's natural that you have more of that. But you would expect some higher order thinking to be happening even at beginner elementary levels as soon as possible. With higher level classes, we can give more responsibility to the learner, so more time for higher order thinking. When I write course materials, if I'm analysing it and it's going like that, I think, oh, oh God, I've got to get some higher order in there, there, towards the end. It just makes me think. Equally, if I had a class that was all higher order, I would think, hang on, students need downtime here. They need to think down the level as well. So one of my objections to the flipped classroom it says, let's do all the higher order in class. Well, no, it's about mixing it all within one lesson. Anyway, go away and play with that idea, and you'll discover all sorts of things about your lower and higher order thinking. Um, National Geographic have an in focus website and recorded webinars. I've done other webinars on the topic of critical thinking, focusing on different levels, so if you're interested in it, you can see the webinars there. The other way to access all of this is to go to my blog, elteachertraining.com, go to the critical thinking button and it will give you all the links you need, all my emails there for the slide. I also noticed on the JALT critical thinking SIG website, they've put online a free booklet that I wrote some years back, actually originally for Italian teachers, but it's got a lot about critical thinking and activities that I use. Slightly dated, I've updated it with the stuff I'm doing next year, but you'll find that there as well. Anyway, thank you for spending the morning with me. Thank you very much for